Well, these are indeed special Sundays for all of us as a church family, for each one of these families. I mentioned that we're dedicating some 35 children this morning, and we celebrate with each family. As a church family, we're serious about the covenant that we just made, and if you've been around Chapel Street long enough, you know how serious we are about next-gen ministries, and especially our children's ministry. Our Chapel Street kids' ministry teams are preparing for what really will be an unprecedented summer due to the growth of our church and the numbers of kids that are coming to us that have been entrusted to us. Uh, our kids' ministry is planning on uh, full Sunday schools for all seven of our weekend services across four campuses. This will be the first time we've ever done that. And as you can imagine, it takes hundreds of volunteers to do that well. And at our church, what we're proud of is that many, many dozens of our volunteers helping children's ministry are middle school and high school students. But during the summer, they go on their own mission trips and projects. And so we need to fill the gap left behind by those students and also give some of our uh, key uh, faithful volunteers some time off. So let me ask a couple of questions. How many of you right now have kids in our Chapel Street Kids Ministry? Just raise your hand. Okay, a bunch of you. How many of you have ever had kids ever in our ministries? I raised both hands. Okay? Now, here's what we want to ask. We want to ask that anyone who has a child in our ministries right now or has ever had a child in Chapel Street uh, Kids Ministries to give us back one hour each month for the summer. That's three hours just to serve and be a helper. You don't have to teach a class just to be in a classroom helping that helps us take care of kids and meet our child protection policy. And we have a need this summer to replace all those middle school and high school students. So if you had a child in our program, we'd like you to step up just for one hour each month to serve. And the way you do that is just scan the code in the back of your chair this morning, and it'll tell you exactly what to do, how to take the next step, and our kids' ministry team will take care of you. Or just go out to the display in the lobby, make yourself available just one hour each month, that's three hours in the summer, and we will take care of this need. And I told them that I think we can do this in two weeks if our, as our church family steps up, and I think we will. It's a challenge. It's a blessed opportunity with these precious kids that have been trusted to us. So please, let's step up and meet this challenge and care for our kids this summer. Now bow with me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the kids that are dedicated here this today and for each mom and dad and extended family. We thank you for our Chapel Street Kids ministry teams and for all those volunteer and all those who will volunteer to step up and give us just three hours this summer. Thank you so much for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think the Bible gives a really good description of who Rahab was as a woman. The writer of Joshua actually devotes an entire portion of the story just to her. And she's clearly the hero of that story. I think that Rahab is a woman who felt like she was not worthy of mercy and grace. Just a woman who felt really down on her luck and somebody who just didn't feel like she was worthy. She had three huge strikes against her by being a woman by being a prostitute, by being a Canaanite. I think the human impulse would be, again, to, to bury her story and not to feature her and um, not make her the hero, but God sees her differently. He sees her heart. He sees her, her faith. I'm drawn towards Rahab because I think she can teach us so much about the Lord and how we live our own lives. I think that we're all broken people and I think that we all fall short, but we can see through Rahab how the Lord can rescue us from that. It speaks volumes about who God is and the way that He views people. It's just a reminder time and time again in Scripture that God sees people in a much different way than we see people. It doesn't matter where you've come from, where you've been, that you can be pulled out of that as long as you just put your faith and your trust in Him, that He is there for you and that He will redeem you. Well, as I think many of you know by now that my, my father was a pastor for over 60 years, but you may not know he did not grow up in a church-going family. In fact, far from it. His own father had died when he was only five years old, so he grew up as the youngest of six children with a single mom, and so he kind of had to figure out life on his own. And he used to tell the story, not often, but he would tell it, about when he was about 15 years old, he uh, had his eye on a certain young lady at his high school. She was pretty and popular, and he had heard uh, that she had a certain reputation with the boys at school, so he wanted to ask her out. He finally got up the courage, asked her out. He borrowed a car from a friend, I think, and went to pick her up to take her out on the first date. And he was kind of excited about the romantic possibilities that they might include. But he said he picked her up 
And before uh, he even started the engine to drive off, she, from her seat in the car, said to him, hey, there's something you need to know about me. And he said, what's that? She said, well, last week I gave my life to Jesus, and there's some things I don't do anymore, she said. Now, when my dad would tell the story, he would say that he was, first of all, surprised that that was the last thing he expected to hear. Second of all, he was a little disappointed. And thirdly, he was impressed because he didn't know much about Jesus. And he was impressed that something about this Jesus had changed this young girl's life. I'll come back to that story a little bit later. As you saw in the video, we're in the third week of a series we're calling Women of Valor. We're looking at the stories of four Old Testament women uh, who have stories of struggle and pain, sometimes abuse, but they're also stories of courageous faith and the grace of God that redeems and transforms their stories. And we started a couple weeks ago with the story of Ruth, a Moabite widow who lost everything, but out of faith in the God of Israel, she served her mother-in-law, Naomi, and eventually trusted herself to her kinsman redeemer, a man named Boaz. Then last week, we looked at the story of Hagar, the mistreated Egyptian slave girl of Abram and Sarai, who was found by God in the wilderness and who eventually said, I have seen the God who sees me. Now, if you thought the story of Hagar was a bit uncomfortable, the story we look at today is even more so in some ways. The story of Rahab, who throughout Scripture is simply called the prostitute of Jericho. Let me give you a little background, kind of rush through the book of Exodus that will lead up to where we are today in the story. The book of Exodus tells us that the people of Israel were captive in Egypt for some 400 years. God called a man named Moses to go to Pharaoh and to demand, let my people go. Pharaoh refuses. God sends 10 plagues on Egypt, the last of which was the story of the Passover, as the Hebrew people were instructed to put the blood of a lamb over the door frames of their homes so the angel of death would pass over those homes. God then delivered his people by parting the Red Sea so they could pass through on dry ground. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. During that <coughs> excuse me, time, God fed them with manna from heaven, led them during the day with a cloud of smoke, and led them at night with a pillar of fire. And eventually Moses, man of God, dies, and a new leader is assigned, Joshua, and God calls him to take possession of the promised land, the land of Canaan. Deep breath, now we start our story today, Joshua chapter 2. We read, Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. Now, Joshua and the people of Israel camped on the other side of the Jordan River, and before crossing the river and engaging in battle with the people of Canaan, or the Canaanites, Joshua wants, to, wants the best information. So he sends out two spies think special ops to scout out the land and especially check out the great walled city of Jericho. Continuing in the scripture, so they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Now the first thing we see here is what I'm calling an unlikely character. An unlikely character. But first we have to talk about, I think what you've noticed, there are elephants in the room. There are two elephants in the room at this point. The first elephant is, the question was, Rahab really a prostitute? Now, the Hebrew word translated prostitute here, uh, or translated as harlot in other translations, is a word zona. Uh, Some have tried to sanitize the story a bit by saying that this word could also refer to an innkeeper. Many ancient Hebrew words were somewhat flexible in meaning. And so the spy stayed with her simply because she was running an inn for travelers. But the problem is when Rahab is referred to in the New Testament, in Hebrews 11 and in James 2, the Greek word used to describe her is the word porne, from which we get our word pornography, and it definitely means prostitute in the New Testament. So now before we rush to judgment or we recoil in disgust, we should ask the question, how did a woman in the ancient world become prostitute? a prostitute. As we've seen in this series, the ancient world was a very dangerous place for women. A woman's value was almost completely based on two things, being married and the ability to have children. So a woman who was either uh, divorced or widowed or in some way abandoned had almost no options in the ancient world. It was either poverty and homelessness or becoming a slave or 
prostitution. Later in the story, we're going to see that Rahab mentions her father and her mother and her brothers and her sisters, but she does not mention a husband or her own children. So it would be safe for us to assume that she had at some point been widowed or abandoned or divorced and left to survive on her own, that her life had been one of pain, neglect, poverty, and desperation. A pastor named Matt Chandler says it this way, no little girl dreams of becoming a prostitute when they grow up. You become a prostitute because very wicked, evil, deplorable things happen to you. And very likely, that's Rahab's backstory. But there's another elephant in the room, and that is, why did Joshua's two spies go to the house of a prostitute in the first place? Well, this is the obvious implication of the story, and some scholars think that language here even has a double meaning that points to some sort of illicit activity. For example, the word translated stayed with or lodged with her can also be translated as to lie with. But there are other reasons for the spies to be there as well. Her house uh, was in or on the wall of Jericho, which we'll find out in a minute, which would have made it easy to get into and out of without being noticed. It's also likely that along with her profession. She also did run some sort of an inn and maybe even a business. We're going to find out there were stalks of flax on her roof, and flax was used to make all kinds of things, including linen cloth. So all this would mean that it was possible that all kinds of people, travelers and merchants and men, were going in and out of her house all the time so the spies could easily just blend in with the crowds. And finally, because there were lots of people coming and going, it would have been a great place to find out things about the city which is what they were there to do in the first place. But the main thing we need to see here is that Rahab is a very unlikely character to show up in the story of God for three reasons, as you heard in the video. First, she's a woman, meaning she was a second-class citizen in a highly patriarchal ancient culture. That's strike one. Secondly, she lives in Jericho, which meant she was a Canaanite, And the Canaanites were polytheistic pagans that strike two. They worshiped gods like El and Asherah, the mother and father gods. They worshiped Baal, the god of fertility and the harvest and many others. And thirdly, on top of being a woman and a pagan, she's also a prostitute, and that's strike three. How do many of you can remember uh, from your high school yearbook the most likely section? No, the the picture of a person or a couple would be the most likely to succeed or the most likely to become president or the most likely to become a movie star. Well, today it's more like, (coughs) excuse me, most likely to become a travel blogger or most likely to become an internet influencer. But in this story, what jumps out at us should be that Rahab is at this point in a category of people that might be called least likely, least likely to succeed, least likely to ever be a recipient of God's grace. Rahab is an unlikely character in God's story, but here is the truth of what the Bible teaches us, that at one time, at one point, we were all part of that same category. Listen to what Paul says in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world or the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is at not work in those who are disobedient. All of us, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So Rahab is not only an unlikely character, she's also a representative character because we all, at one point, are undeserving of God's grace. So we see an unlikely character. Secondly here, we see an unlikely faith. An unlikely faith. Um, The churches I grew up in always had Sunday night services. How many of you grew up in a church that had a Sunday night church? Okay. I have to admit, as a boy, and my dad was a pastor, I grew up in the church, I was not a big fan of Sunday night church. And man, I almost always had to miss the fourth quarter of whatever game I was watching or the last couple innings of a great ball game or we had to miss one of our favorite TV shows and we had to go to church. But every now and then, there were moments at Sunday night church that made it kind of all worthwhile. Uh, Since it was the second service of the day, sometimes uh, my, my dad wouldn't have a second sermon. He'd have what he called testimony time. 
I think it saved him a double preparation on Sunday, but just people would stand up and just share whatever God was doing in their life, and people would listen and encourage them, and we'd pray together. Well, one Sunday night, when I was 12 or 13 years old, a lady stood up just a couple rows behind where my brother and I always sat with our mom. And I looked, kind of glanced back at her. I did not recognize her, so I figured she was new to the church. It was a small church. Thank you. I'm not sure that'll help, but thank you. Um, <laughs> probably less people than were right here in this, this center section. And so uh, I figured she was new. And she started telling her story. And I don't remember all the details of it. She's talked about some bad decisions and some painful things in her life. And that just recently, some women from the church had invited her to come to a women's Bible study. And she had just in the last week or so committed her life to Jesus in faith, become a follower of Jesus. And then she said, as she wrapped up her testimony, with tears coming down her face, she said, and I remember this clearly, I know I have a heck of a lot of changing to do, but I believe Jesus is going to help me. But she didn't say heck of a. She said a, a different way, a way I never heard in church before. And my brother and I immediately looked at each other and started to giggle. We got in trouble for giggling in church because we thought, no, yeah, she has some changes to do. She doesn't even know how to talk in church. And it took me years to realize how beautiful that woman's story was that night. Look at verse 2. Joshua chapter 2, the king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them parenthesis, but she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan, and as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Now here, if we're paying attention, there's a third elephant in the room. What about Rahab's lie? Before we get to that, uh, let me point out there's clearly an element of humor here, almost a Keystone Cops kind of effect. The king has received a report that two enemy spies have entered the city. It's a threat to national security. He sends word to Rahab, most likely through an armed search party, bring the spies out. Rahab then completely outsmarts the king and all his men by hiding the spies on the roof and fabricating a, a fantastic story. And he sends, she sends them on a wild juice goose chase outside the city, even tells them to hurry, they might catch up, so they won't go on her roof and check out what's happening up there and search her house. In the process, she offers a deliberate and calculated untruth, a lie. So, is lying always wrong? Or is the Bible somehow suggesting that it's okay sometimes to lie? Now, volumes have been written on the subject of what's called situational ethics, and I'm not going to solve it all here. But there are basically three positions taken by ethicists. First one is something called moral absolutism. That is, it's always wrong to lie. It's the ninth of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not bear false witness to your neighbor. And faced with this situation, Rahab should have told the truth about where the spies were. They're up behind, they're up behind the, the stalks of flax and then just trusted God to protect them. In other words, never lie. The second position is called conflicting absolutism. That is, lying is wrong, but so is uh, giving up the spies to be executed. That's also wrong. So the issue is choosing the lesser of two wrongs or the lesser of two evils. Lying is lesser evil than contributing to the death of two human beings. So that's the decision she made. And thirdly, there's, a, there's something called grad, graded absolutism, which was similar, but a little bit different. It's that some of God's laws are just more important than others. That is, protecting life is more important than not lying. But let me just say a couple of things. First of all, the dilemma uh, that particular dilemma is not the center of this story. Rahab has never called on the carpet anywhere for making up this story. In fact, she's mentioned three times in the New Testament. Twice is referred to as Rahab the prostitute, never as Rahab the liar. In fact, she's regarded as the hero of this story. Hebrews chapter 11 says, By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. 
James chapter 2, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. So the New Testament considers Rahab righteous for this act. Now, an example we might look at from history is the German pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer during World War II, who agonized over the decision to participate in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Bonhoeffer was a committed pacifist. Uh, He became convinced, however, that Hitler needed to be stopped, saying, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. And so he chose to participate. He was caught. The plot failed, and he was ultimately arrested and executed for treason against Germany. Now, in the same way, Rahab's decision here is an act of great faith and comes at great risk. Because if the spies were discovered, she was found to be lying, she would have faced certain torture and execution, and probably even her whole family. On the other hand, if she turned the spies in, they're right up there in the roof, she would have been certainly rewarded by the king of Jericho and seen as the hero of Jericho. So why would she take such a risk for two Hebrew spies? Verse 8, Joshua 2. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord, and we can't see this in English, but she uses the personal name of the God of Israel here, Yahweh. I know that Yahweh, the Lord, has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og and the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan whom you completely destroyed. Let me pause there. Sihon and Og were two greatly feared kings in that region. I always say that Og is one of the great names in the Bible. You can just imagine what a guy named Og looked like. Okay, Yet under Moses, they were completely completely destroyed. You can see that that story in Deuteronomy chapters 2 and 3. She says, when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, Yahweh, is your God, is God in heaven above and on the earth below. And if you remember, almost exactly the same words the pagan sailors in the story of Jonah said. Now here we see Rahab's unlikely faith. First, she heard She heard about the invisible God of the Israelites, and she knows his name, the Lord, Yahweh, the one who is. He is that he is. She's heard about how God delivered them from Egypt by parting the Red Sea. She may have heard about the pillar of fire by night and the cloud of smoke by day. She heard how they defeated the two feared kings of Sihon and Og. She heard now that the army of Israel was headed toward Jericho. Secondly, she believed In verse 8, we read, Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord, I know that the Lord Yahweh has given you this land. Now, I think Rahab looked at her own life, looked at how she got to where she was, and came to the conclusion that the gods of her culture, El and Asherah and Baal and all the others, were powerless to help her. In fact, did not care a whit for her life. I think she heard and believed that Yahweh, the strange, invisible, and powerful God of the Israelites, was indeed God of heaven above and of the earth below. And she decided to cast her lot, to bet her life on that God. She decided to align herself not with the culture and pagan religions of the Canaanites, not with her culture, but with the God of Israel. And this is relevant, so relevant for the world we live in today. A pastor and author named Francis Chan has written, if life is a river, then pursuing Christ requires swimming upstream. When we stop swimming or actively following him, we automatically begin to be swept downstream. In a lot of ways, that's why we dedicate children. We're dedicating, asking parents to commit asking a church family to commit to helping these young people learn how to swim upstream in a culture that wants to sweep them away. Rahab decides by faith to swim upstream. She believed the coming of the Israelites was not her destruction, but rather that it would be her salvation. And then thirdly, she demonstrates that faith. Verse 12, Joshua 2. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family. 
because I have shown kindness to you. That word kindness is a translation of the Hebrew word hesed, which often is used to describe the loving kindness and mercy of God himself. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there for three days until they return, and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us, uh, on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father, mother, your brothers, and all your family into your house. If any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. So Rahab demonstrated her faith by hiding the spies, by including her family. She asked that her whole family be covered by the hesed, the loving kindness and mercy of God, and finally by tying the scarlet cord in her window. Now, many see this scarlet cord as a symbol or as uh, recalling the exodus from Egypt when the people of Israel put the blood of the lambs over their door frames so the angel of death would pass over them. Rahab demonstrates faith by hanging that scarlet cord so that everyone in her house will be saved. She demonstrated her unlikely faith. And thirdly, we'll see here that she leaves an unlikely legacy. We're going to jump ahead to Joshua chapter 6. Verse 22 is sort of the wrap-up of the story. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out with all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. So Rahab is saved, spared, along with her entire family, saved by the grace and mercy of Yahweh. And again, this points us to Jesus. And we go back to what Paul said in Ephesians 2. We're going to read it again and then add the couple of verses I did not read the first time. Paul writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed in the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And notice her whole family is saved. And just a word here about what I call the generational impact of the gospel. And I've seen this many times over the years, I've seen it in my own family. When a person comes to faith in Jesus, very often the result is generational. That it's not just one person whose life is transformed and changed, it's a whole family tree begins to straighten out. That's why the dedication of children is so meaningful and important. Finally, Rahab is included in the great redemptive story of God. If we jump ahead to the very beginning of the New Testament, Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 1, we see a long list of names. Let me go through part of that for you so you see something. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Then we skip down to verse 5. Salomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of King David. Skipping ahead again to verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Do you see that? Do you see that? God has not only rescued and saved this single broken woman named Rahab, with three strikes against her, he saves her whole family, and then he places her in the family tree of Jesus, the Messiah. 
I told you I'd come back to my dad's date. As I said, he always said he was uh, disappointed, but rather impressed. Just two weeks later or so, two of his high school football buddies invited him to come with them to a Methodist revival meeting. He had rarely, if ever, even been in church. That night, he gave his heart to Jesus, too, partly because of the influence of that young woman. A couple years later after that, at age 17, he began preaching. A couple years after that, he met my mom, who was also the first believer in her whole family tree. A year after that, I was born. And ever since I heard the story of my dad's disappointing date and the teenage girl who decided to follow Jesus, I've wanted to meet her. I've wanted to tell her of the legacy of that one single decision, how it touched my dad's life, how it eventually touched my life, how it touched my son's lives, how it touches my grandchildren's lives, and how her decision flows down through generations, a single courageous act of faith. And I wish I could meet her to thank her. And I don't know how it's going to work on that day, but I hope in heaven someday I get that chance. The story of Rahab is about an unlikely character, an unlikely faith, and a very unlikely legacy. And her story tells us no matter where we've been, no matter where you've been, no matter what pain or brokenness is part of your life, by faith the mercy of God can rescue and change. And not only that, the mercy of God can produce a legacy of faith beyond your wildest imagination. That's the story of Rahab. You bow with me in prayer. Lord God, I would thank you for your word today and for this uncomfortable and unlikely but beautiful story. Remind us that we are all unlikely recipients of your grace and mercy. And remind us of the legacy that can be left by one courageous act of faith. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. What a joy it is to gather today to dedicate children, to listen to God's word, and to sing worship to our King of Kings. We don't want that to stop today as we gather here in person or online. We want to continue to connect with you during the rest of the week. So I'm going to ask everyone to take a moment, even right now during this service, to scan the QR code in the seat back in front of you and request the Spring Connect card. It's just gonna take a minute for you to fill out your name and your email address, and then later you'll receive our connection card, and that will give us important information and your contact information so that we can continue to connect with you. This is important so that we can share ministry opportunities and Chapel Street news with you. As you consider Pastor Brian's challenge to dedicate three hours of your summer this week, just know that we have that need because of church growth, because more and more children are coming to Chapel Street and may be hearing about Jesus for the very first time. So please consider how you can serve. And then also, we have three exciting weeks coming up for VBS. And again, hundreds of kids will be joining us those weeks. So if you haven't already, please sign up your children for a VBS week of fun and faith. And then also, please prayerfully consider how you can serve one of those weeks. There's disco balls out in the lobby where you can scan and share with us how you could serve that week. And now, if you could please rise for the benediction. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now go in the power, the mercy, and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ.